Okay. Well, there we are, at least for now. Move this back just a scooch. So, yeah, for those who are actually joining live as opposed to watching the replay, que pasó, obviously. Very happy to have you here. Finally getting ready to do this big discussion all about Ms. Gwende. Everyone knows it's Gwendy. So, as peeps start to filter through, I will be sharing this link on the socials and such, as is always the case. So, yeah. Actually, very stoked, everybody, because I am getting ready to go so see... Uh, mutant that. Getting ready to go see the Batman this evening. Yeah, they're doing this early fan event, and extremely excited about that. So... Let's get this link out there. But yeah, three books now. The trilogy completed. And this will be a full-on spoilers discussion. Just putting this in the Hail to Stephen King Facebook group real quick. Had some new members join up this past week, which was Q. So, okay, edit post. There is the link thing. Okay, so I hope, at least for those tuning in, you finally got your books. I know that was a bit of an issue for some who were waiting on, and it's been it's been tough for not just Cemetery Dance, but for lots of different peeps for a while who are in the publishing game because it's uh, it is rough in that regard. Not just with issues at printing presses and stuff, but even though we're significantly removed, almost two like around two years now from uh, Captain Trips hitting. Nonetheless, stuff is still not going particularly smoothly for a lot of peeps. So, okay, so that is shared. I'm going to jump back to the live chat stuff. Yeah, I don't want to go just like too far back. I wonder if I should just prop this up a little bit. So, yeah, I guess I could do that. Might actually help the process, although, sorry, thanks for bearing with. Put the Z's up. Yeah, but now it feels crooked. Eh, well, whatever. Hmm. Close enough. Scooch over here so y'all can see all the coolness back and behind. But I like to at least give this till right at around when we hit double digits on the viewership. But um, since I'm seeing Batman, I do not have tons and tons of time. But for those who are just jumping in, Richard Forrest says, Hey, Fuego. Richard, what's going on? Hola. Uh, long days and pleasant nights, Fuego, says Austin. Good day to you, sir. Hope uh, you're having a spooktacular Tower Tuesday. SK Fan says, Long days and pleasant nights, Fuego. Same back to you, SK Fan. Obviously a fantabulously rad status name there. Uh, Jose Storm says, Hey, Fuego. How have you been doing? Well, you know, better than I was a couple weeks ago. You know, the... The ebb and flow of, I guess, just the weird last couple of years that we've had. And uh, that I was originally supposed to be doing a review of the book like the day it came out. But I had so many different things happen in a span of a few days there. Some of it was health related. Some of it was like a little more on the personal side of things. There's some work related stuff. And then also my book was like a couple days late. So that was just uh, adding insult to injury, unfortunately. But yes, I'm thankfully in a significantly better TED space now. And, you know, that's thanks to support from, you know, my friends and family and everybody. And so since I see that we are in the double digits, this one goes to 11. We are going to get things started off properly. But yes, Jose, thank you for inquiring about that. I am thankfully doing better. And uh, yeah, it's uh, hey, this. the last couple of years have been a process for everybody, whether it's you know, living situations or, you know, physical health or, you know, work or whatever the hell it may be. So let's just get things started up proper because I only I need to be leaving for uh, this uh, this Batman screening in right around an hour. So I'm just going to get this rock a locking and whoever jumps on, jump along on. OK. Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime and Fuego. And if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on Hell Yeah! Stephen King, that is Reezy. Yeah, I've been doing this program for, 
boy, this is uh, earlier this year here in 2022. It was the start of the sixth year of this. We're over 300 episodes in. So obviously, Bevaninos and welcome to the horror show. So very happy to have you here. If you are tuning into the live broadcast or if you are checking this out after the fact, I'm just going to get a sip of my fruity looking drink. And we will get started because so I have done individual reviews of all three of these books already over the years. So first we had Gwendy's Button Box, the first collaboration between Chiz and uh, Psy King. Then we had the one where Richard went at it by himself, which was Gwendy's Magic Feather. Now, just one thing to say is that the uh, Cemetery Dance or like around a year or so ago, maybe even it was a little bit longer, but there is a special edition of this that I pre-ordered a while back and it's supposed to have some new information from Psy King, like a new passage or introduction or something something exclusive besides some artwork to that edition. It's been delayed a number of times, unfortunately, so still haven't gotten to see what sort of additional insight that could impart. So I'm still intrigued having just reread both of these in the last like day or so leading up to this review. And then lastly, what I put a review up of about a week ago which was Gwendy's final task. And so I will say right off the bat that I have had some mixed feelings and some misgivings about this series, but uh, especially with the most recent, just reading all three in succession, which is what I just got done doing, I found some things to appreciate more in, uh, in some of the entries. And then there was also stuff that just continued to stick out like a sore thumb. But the main intention of this discussion, whether you hit it up in the comments after the live show, because I know a Tuesday live show in the middle of the week at, you know, four something Pacific is uh, it's a little difficult for some. We've had some uh, we've had some open discussions for a while about if we only shifted the book of the month to, you know, one Saturday and then kept every other pre-recorded episode Tuesday, I'm hoping we can get that solidified at some particular point because I know the weekends for those tuning into a live stream are significantly easier with, you know, work and kids and family and stuff like that. But so this is going to be a complete trilogy spoilers discussion. And so initially I was thinking that I wanted to go back and consult my notes and, you know, that I had when, uh, uh, button box and magic feather first came out and then maybe even go back and rewatch those reviews those videos but i kind of decided against that i wanted to really go into this as i have with a lot of rereads for hail to stephen king with a fresh set of eyes and ears and just i don't know try to immerse myself into it and get a different perspective as opposed to being reminded of how i felt previously the only exception is most definitely going to be final task having that I've read this three times now in the last couple of weeks. So I read it, I listened to it, I read it again. And then I was even listening to it, uh, the Marina Ireland, uh, Marin Ireland, Marina Ireland, I, I forget her name. But right before going live here, I did crank this up on the audio book just once more as I was listening to the very end of this book. And what happens to Gwendy? Everyone knows it's Gwendy. So uh, the main intention of this, as I was saying, whether you're hitting it up in the comments afterwards or you're here in the live chat over the course of the discussion, hit me up with your thoughts on individual volumes, on the trilogy as a whole, maybe what you think is the strongest of these three books, because I am most definitely going to give an order as to quality and what I think about these. And it may actually surprise some because seen a lot of different thoughts about this. Some think, you know, the the one that, uh, you know, Chismar did by himself is the weakest. I've seen others like praise the fact that it's this kind of murder mystery sort of situation. I've seen some say this newest third and final entry, the final task is the best. And so I don't know, it's uh, art is subjective as I constantly contend on here, but I see that uh, SK fan 19 is jumping in with some additional information. This one was my favorite of the three, uh, which isn't saying much. Yes, I kind of echo those sentiments. Uh, this trilogy is at the bottom of my King list. The first one was a decent novella. The second one could have been good. But the side stories with her wife and, uh, excuse me, with her wife and parents were just repetitive. Same with the third, her condition just got too repetitive. And that's one of, it's one of my biggest issues with this book is that it was so mad, so much, not just thematic retread, but I, I mean, we're talking, I don't want to say recycling of plot points because I've even said in various reviews over the years that, of covering Psy King that, yeah, Stephen King does write about 
writers a lot of the time. We have that here. He writes about, you know, going into the layers of villains, you know, whether it's the outsider or insomnia or it or whatever. So there are, there are, or whether he's writing about teachers. I mean, he does have his go-tos that he returns to, but he, he circles back often because he does write them convincingly. And he always flushes out those characters well, because you write what you know. I believe that's the intention that everybody likes to mention with regards to this. But as opposed to me just sounding off, I really am hopeful uh, as opposed to me just, you know, giving a dissertation or whatever that I can get more thoughts from everybody else and just recant them. I know Austin is uh, always very vocal. I see Jose Storms is saying some stuff. So let's uh, let's have some palaver, everybody. Okay. Yep. And SK fan, I, I knew you were talking about the husband, but I mean, even like in Magic Feather and then also in Final Task, like we have a passage where it's a discussion of Gwendy going on a shopping spree with a close friend of hers. And they go to Cracker Barrel each time. And I'm like, I had to pull a double take as I, I went back and consulted Magic Feather as I was reading Final Task. I'm like, wait, didn't she go on like a holiday shopping spree with a friend in the last one? And I, if I remember, I think it was even the same friend. So there is just, I, uh, anyway, we'll get to it. But uh, uh, to continue, the Dark Tower and Dairy Parts in the third were just half-assed and too rushed. Yeah. And SK fan, I honestly felt like they were, they were put in there to be kind of, I mean, I'm sure it was done with the most amount of respect possible because, you know, Chismar is obviously a Psy King fanboy, as I am. You know, he just has the, the blessed opportunity to collaborate with him and also to, you know, publish some, some works of his, especially in the deluxe editions that Cemetery Dance has done. Holy shnikes, are they badass. And I'm very, uh, I, I count myself blessed as well to own a good deal of those. But it felt very much in a lot of ways, especially when you read Magic Feather. But um, the fact that Magic Feather at least was kind of being its own thing to a degree, although you don't you do go back to Castle Rock and there's another murder mystery in Castle Rock. You know the comparisons we can make there. They even mentioned Frank Dodd in it. But um, yeah, in the third one, it I and I said this in the non-spoiler review, and since this is all spoilers and everything is free range, please, if you're just jumping on the discussion I want to hear thoughts about not just Final Task, but the trilogy as a whole, impressions, and where, like, what is going to stick with us, if anything, from a character of Gwendy that she just escalated in importance in the multiverse in general, which I, it, it's one of the things that I definitely kind of was a little off put by, but I know that there were a lot of others who were, were really digging it, but it felt very much kind of Holly Gibney to me. I'm like, really, another book with? Wendy? Okay. Okay. And I could be like, yeah, you know, Chiz maybe just squeezed every, every bit out of this story and this character that he, that he kind of could have, but you know, that's a, that's just a passing kind of thought as opposed to my, my final judgment or, or anything like that. But similar to with the Castle Rock television series where it felt very much like we have access to all these characters. So let's cram in as many as possible. And yeah, King has definitely been guilty of that himself i mean a, a book like bag of bones for instance has a lot of different references to other stuff with ralph roberts showing up and, and you know other th insomnia is another one that has a lot of references tommy knockers has a lot of easter eggs so yeah easter eggs are one thing but when you're just kind of overstuffing the turkey and also trying to escalate the importance of a situation like it, I, I don't know in comparison but the fact that it pulled in the dark tower elements of, you know, Tahin and Loman and these different things. And also the tower in and of itself, it just, it felt forced. It felt rushed. And dare I say, it didn't feel deserving, but once again, personal opinion. Okay. Especially being a big tower junkie. I was like, wow. Okay. And you know, we had eight books, you know, leading up to such a big grandiose thing. And yes, I know we have stuff like Ur and we, we have, uh, obviously the stuff with Dinky and everything's eventual, which we'll get to that story here and near the end of the proceedings. But um, yeah, it's, it's one thing to have a short story where you play like a small piece of the puzzle, like a small part in the process, you know, you know, like a Dinky or like a Shimi or even to a, a slightly higher degree, like a father Callahan. But I mean, yeah, Gwendy and everything that she represents and just, yeah, the importance of the character. I, I just really, and this is where I, I definitely threw out an opinion that I knew was going to be controversial, but I just had to do it because I kind of felt it to be the case. And I know 
a term like Mary Sue is a very loaded term. And so that's why I don't use it lightly. But uh, as as is even mentioned in the Magic Feather book by Chismar, the one that he wrote by himself, uh, Gwendy is reflecting at one particular point, and she's like, I've had a very charmed life. Now, that's why I, I think the first and the third book are significantly superior, because there is actually like repercussions to the power that she's burdened with, loss of loved ones and stuff like that. Magic Feather is the like really sugary kind of everything kind of works out, you know, and uh, I, I use these powers to save my mom and to solve a murder and all this different stuff. But um, yeah, at least where there's kind of that ebb and flow, the give and take, which you especially get in the first book. And then also to, to a degree in book three, uh, it's, it's a little bit more important, but that she, she has lived a very charmed life from documentary Academy Awards to success in politics and as a writer. And so and for, for that reason, I know that a lot of people, for instance, were with The Force Awakens. And this is the first example that comes to mind. And I guess I will use this really quickly in the fact that, you know, Ray was this mysterious, unproven character. And I love Daisy Ridley in those movies. I thought she was terrific. I mean, I, I was disappointed Boyega kind of got the shaft a little bit. And in, in you know, episode nine, you really thought that he was going to, excuse me, episode seven, you really thought that he was going to be just as powerful as her, if not more. But she, Gwendy just gets pushed to the pinnacle of just power and, and, you know, importance and all that other stuff. And she's like the sweetest, most blameless, wonderful character. But in some ways, I, as I said in the non-spoiler, I find that a little bit off-putting because the, the King characters that I've always found the most fascinating are the, the Larry Underwoods. And even to a lesser degree, like a Jack Torrance, because they're not just these pristine perfections of sorts like they are troubled just dark people with demons and i don't know uh I, but then again gwendy does make the ultimate sacrifice at the very end of this series and it's very noble and very awesome in that regard and you have to really tip your hat to her but i i, I will get to it i i will i i will definitely drop the full fledged bit of thoughts but i saw that some other peeps are jumping on so uh, Jose Storm says, I haven't read the books yet, but I've always been curious with the trilogy. But again, I put it off with the mix of with the mix of reviews. Yeah. Austin chimes in and says, Gwendy's Gwendy's Magic Feather is definitely my least favorite. It just wrapped everything up too, uh, too neatly. And yeah, way too neatly. And dare I say the stakes were the lowest in Magic Feather of any other in the trilogy, especially for just what befalls Gwendy. You know, there's really... There's nothing directly bad that happens to Gwendy in Magic Feather, whereas in Button Box and in Final Task, yes, there is most definitely some negative stuff that goes down for her. Uh, Austin also says uh, uh, it, it just wrapped everything up neatly and quickly without and completely ripped off the dead zone at the end. Yes. Well, for me, Austin, this ripped off the dead zone in both Magic Feather and in Final Task and in the same sequential order of the importance of what happened in the dead zone, because in uh, in the dead zone, obviously the, the first, like, well, I guess it's really the second act of the book, but where Johnny Smith turns into this detective who has this second sight. And, you know, he is, he's imbued with this power to help solve a string of murders in Castle Rock. The exact same thing happens with Gwendy in Magic Feather. You know, she gets back on the chocolates and she discovers this, this thing she bought as a kid and she was 10. Well, we'll get to it, but yeah. So she, she suddenly is she's shaking people's hands and she's able to like peer into their past and all this other stuff. And so, yeah, based on her abilities, she is able to solve this murder and, and just in this tooth fairy murder or whatever. And then in the third book, I, I implied it. I kind of hinted at it in my non-spoiler review, but she, just like Johnny Smith, makes this immense sacrifice of her own life that very few will know. I, I mean, a, a sacrifice that's, in, you know, that's never known kind of thing as I wrote in the song many, many years ago. But yeah, she lays down her life just like Johnny Smith does for the greater good of, in Johnny Smith's case, it's of saving the world. And this is where I'm just like, wow, Gwendy really rose in importance very quickly if she's going to save all the worlds. I'm like, we had eight books for Roland and his quartet to do that and only for the cyclical structure. And this is Tower Canon, obviously. And so at least it does, it does mention that the Crimson King is dead. And so, yes, this does take place after 
you know, Roland has restarted again. We, although we don't know if he's just killing the Crimson King over and over. And then I still haven't even gotten to the RF stuff and, you know, how Richard Ferris, if he, like, did we retcon who he was originally implied to be with Button Box? There's just so many questions that I think a lot of people have because if Richard Ferris is Randall Flagg, as the first book most definitely implied, did they pull like a fucking Negan with him where he's trying to, he's almost like making amends for, you know, prior wrongdoings. But I mean, was he betrayed by the Crimson King and Mordred kills him? And we know that, you know, RF is able to just regenerate, so to speak. And so did he regenerate in this Richard Ferris form? And now he's actually working with the tech corporation against his former employers. Although he was always like the Joker, for instance, as I was just rewatching the Dark Knight the other night, you know, an agent of chaos. I mean, these are these are the things which are fun to debate and to contemplate, but also in the same right, I'm just like, I don't know if I like that, but hey, it's not it's not my book. I'm just the one reviewing it and you know having palaver discussing. So uh, back to what some of the others are saying. Okay, this is a new name. Um, uh, Seymour says, I haven't read these yet, but I'm anxious to hear you talk about how they connect to the Dark Tower, like any character and or location overlaps. Well, it's it's really just the type of character as opposed to, you know, just like direct, direct characters. You know, you've got, you've got Tahini, you have Loman, and you have mentions of the Crimson King, and you have mentions of the Tower, and you have mentions of the beans and the animal guardians. And so it's, it's almost very similar there. There's this character, Bobby, who's a Tahin and he imparts a lot of information to Gwendy about the nature of all of this in one particular scene. And it's very similar to where, um, uh, what, uh, Perkis, uh, God, I'm trying to remember, uh, name of homie in, uh, what black house. He was, uh, uh, Parkus, yeah. So when when Parkus is basically telling the adult Jack over in Midworld, he just gives him like a quick little cliff notes of the nature of the mythology. That's essentially what this villain gives to Gwendy at one particular point later in the book. And it's really to bring up to speed non Tower junkie readers, people who aren't really that familiar with those Stephen King books. And, and there's a lot of that in both of the sequels, but most definitely final tasks, just like little bits to like, Hey, catch up on this. Here's, and you know, just to understand the significance of this particular plot beat, you just need to know that in the previous books, this happened and so on. And so I don't know. It's a, I still really feel like they, they kind of use the tower connections in kind of a gimmicky way. And it, as uh, SK fan 19 was saying, it was relatively underdeveloped and it, it didn't really bring a lot of new stuff to the table aside from the fact that Gwendy is and like you thought Holly Gibney was beloved and important and all this other stuff like man it's in the grand scheme of the multiverse like she is ginormous status at this particular point especially with what she does so uh continuing on uh Ryan says it was okay I'm a sucker for anything tower related though and yeah I as, as Ryan's a, a member of the Hail the Stephen King Facebook group and has been for quite a while shout out to you man um I, I perhaps am being just a little more judgmental than I should be about this. I don't know. But but for me, it felt like just those connections and those references just for the sake of upping the stakes as opposed to really fitting the narrative, especially the narrative that we had in the first two books. But perhaps it was the logical, just, I mean, sequels are supposed to be bigger and higher stakes and all that stuff. So how else to make the third and final book in this trilogy just have that immense amount of importance aside from tying it in with the multiverse and with all of those bigger things and, and themes and stuff that has already come before. So uh, SK fan chimes in again and says, if the, uh, if the second would have been full on her and the sheriff pursuing the tooth fairy, that would have been cool. And the story. Yeah. Uh, I can agree with you there. And I do like the fact that we get more with, uh, with Norris Ridgwick. He was a minor character in needful things. And he ends up taking over for Pangborn once he retires. And I know he was mentioned in, I believe he was mentioned in bag of bones for sure. Passingly. And I know, in I know in one of the other books where we had a, a castle rock reference, but nonetheless, it's nice in uh, a magic feather. And in the third book that Norris does have something to do. And his character is shown as having matured and having eventually gained respect, although it does take some time, most notably in the second book. And that even in the third book, when he comes back around after the thing goes down with Gwendy's husband, it, it, I'm just glad that we got more from that character because I 
we we got some interesting glimmers in the in needful things. And we also get to what is it, Sandra or Sandy, the woman who'd been on the force as well. She was a minor, minor character in Needful Things. And so she pops by back up in this in the second book, and also at the beginning of the third book, actually, when Gwendy is about to blast up into space in 2026. So okay, continuing on. Uh, Jose says, Fuego, do you think Psy King would return in the Tower Canon with a full-on spinoff or something like an eighth book after seven? Well, Jose, the thing is that the closest bit that we got from King about anything more Tower related until we got to this. And I, if I were more of a betting man beyond the sports that I do here and there, the sports betting, like if I was like a big time betting sort of dude, it's like, okay, would you bet? lunch? Would you bet a car payment or would you bet a house payment? I would probably bet a mortgage payment on the fact that it was Richard Chismar's idea to bring the tower stuff into this narrative. And I really do question once again, just how involved Steve actually was in the creation of this book, aside from, because I know I've heard that they were kind of hockey putting it back and forth. And so that was similar to what uh, Steve did with uh, his son, Owen, for Sleeping Beauties. But with that in mind, that's the last time that uh, El Rey actually said anything about another entry pertaining to anything Dark Tower related. And that was where he said that he would like to finally do Battle of Jericho Hill as opposed to, I mean, we saw it in the comic books, but that was just working off notes that him and Robert Firth put together for, um, you know, the guys at Marvel. So he has said that he would like to do something else. I would even be fine with another young Roland short story, like a little sisters of Euloria, or even like what we got with, uh, you know, went through the keyhole, which I just reread last month. So I don't know. I, I think he's got another one in him and I don't know. It's not like what happens with Gwendy really changes much, but Gwendy does confirm that there are still those agents of evil out there that still want to destroy the tower, still want to uh, induce discordia and just the, the chaos across all worlds. Like there are forces still trying to make that happen is at least if anything, the one super cool thing that you can glean from, which does leave it wide open for a sequel Dark Tower book where kind of like what they said they were trying to do with the movie, you know, he finally has the Horde of Eld in, in role in Death's Chain. And uh, yeah, like it's the last time around. So, and, and things would be obviously a little bit different. Would you still have your same new Kata? Would you still have, you know, Eddie and Jake and Oi and, uh, and Susanna, or would they, you know, would they be the same? Would they be different? Would all of them even be there last time around? I, I feel like there is a desire for King to do it. And maybe with, you know, if it does happen the way I I'm speculating, you know, once again, there's no confirmation that Richard was the one who wanted to have the Dark Tower connections within this, but maybe dipping the toe in here can just really light the fire at his age to, you know, we're hoping we have another decade plus, who the hell knows? And I mean, hell, it'd be amazing if Psy King lives to be over a hundred years old or something, because it happens all the time. He's in relatively good health now, which is great. So, I mean, let's not even theorize that possibility at this moment, but I would hope that since he is in, in his twilight years, so to speak, um, and yet still very prolific creatively with getting fairy tale in September, I, I'm hoping that this little just toe dipping, as I mentioned, gets the gears going again and puts just and lights a fire under that ace to, to return and write a tower book properly himself. But as of now, it was 2017 on a, a book stop in Toronto, I believe, for the Sleeping Beauties tour, which was the last time he mentioned doing anything tower related. So, uh, okay, jump in there. Yeah, yeah. Battle of Toll or Jericho Hill. Well, well, well oh, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. That's what I thought you were saying, Juggalo Assassin. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I will say the rich guy in the third, I really hated and glad he got what he deserved. They did a good job on him, despite him being a ripoff of Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely was. And, and while he was kind of somewhere between Bezos and like an Elon Musk, but they also mentioned SpaceX in this third book. So I honestly, for, for what Gareth Winston, I think his name was, he was, as I said, in this uh, non-spoiler review of Final Task, the third book, I was just like, Jesus Christ, man, like, is he not the most like mustache twirling sort of villain where it is so obvious that he is villainous? 
And they, they take a couple passes at trying to make you think that he is not the villain. And as I was reading and then later on listening, I, obviously when you're listening, or at least in my case, I've already read it. So I know, you know what happens and how he is revealed to be the villain. And I'm just like, really? You tried to, you know, do a little bait and switch and tried to make us think otherwise. But yet the most evident thing was very obvious all along. So you couldn't fool me, man. So, yeah, he was a real schmuck bag. Uh, piece of shite but the thing about him for me was that he was just such a one note very obvious sort of villain that i don't know he was just one dimensional to me in that particular regard and also with the final task uh supporting characters like like i'm glad we got some more from norris uh there was also um gwendy's friend who was in the government who actually gets her set up with the tech corporation and gets her in the position to be on this rocket as this like weather advisor to actually finally dispose of the button box after all of these years so that it can't fall into the wrong hands. So that, that character was also decently developed and we get a little bit more from her husband, but really like the rest of the crew, especially um, on the space station, I mean, get a little bit uh, most notably with, uh, with the bug doctor as he's called, but I'm like, He's got like arachnids and stuff. And I, I guess answer bugs, but yeah, you know, whatever. Excuse me. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't really feel it, it wasn't one of those like really rich, deep, extended cast of characters. Really, throughout the entirety of the series, it's it's really Gwendy's series, 100 percent And she's the only character that I feel like really has this rich depth to her, even if she is like squeaky clean and everything, doesn't have really much edge to her so to speak. But yeah, everybody else are just kind of, I don't know. They're, they're just they're It's like in, you know, end scene and, you know, they're there and then they're gone and there's not really as much to, you know, sink their per proverbial teeth into. I mean, a little bit with her parents in the second book and I guess a little bit in the first book and the fact that they're mentioned as being alcoholics. And then when she gets the box, they stop drinking. So, so there's, there's little shreds here and there, but it is really, the Gwendy show in this entire trilogy through and through. And um, yeah. So in any event, uh, we got some others jumping on. Um, okay. Uh, if he does another tower related book says SK fan 19, it should be a sequel to black house long overdue for it. Despite Straub not likely returning, he could maybe get Joe to write it with him. Man, as, as much as that feels like a, the equivalent of like a nerdgasm wet dream or something for him and Joe to, because Joe, was actually King's heir apparent after he got in the accident. And then, you know, within like a year or so later, he got the pneumonia and he was pondering his own mortality, which is why he did the stretch run and did five, six, and seven as quickly as he did, because he's like, I don't know how much time I have left and I got to finish this. But when there is that essence of uncertainty, he was like, all right, Joe, you are the one that I would choose to finish my magnum opus if I'm not able to. But I think Joe is really so wrapped up in, his own original IPs at this particular point, whether, I mean, he just got done doing the Sandman crossover with lock and key, which was really dope. And he's working on, I believe a new collection of shorts and he has a new novel. Plus he's still doing so much comic related. Um, yeah. I, as much as I would love to see it happen, uh, perhaps, you know, throttle and uh, in the tall grass are really going to be the only examples we get, but yeah, SK fan 19, I am 100% about the fact that, I am hopeful that if we do get another Tower book, it brings uh, Jack Sawyer in there. And I mean, Jack Sawyer teaming up with Roland or any members of the Cots hat would be amazing. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'd find some way to get Holly in there. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, yeah, I, I think that whether King ends up having to do it by himself because, you know, Strap's health is unfortunately not very good right now. Um, they've been talking about a third and final entry in that proverbial trilogy for what couple decades now or 15 plus years but because i know we just reread black house in the last year for its anniversary because that came out in 2001 so yeah it's been like 20 years and they have been passingly discussing it for a while so that would be the most intriguing and awesome way to go about it in my estimation because we do know jack sawyer is alive over in presumably mid-world or maybe just another level of that tower i mean he's definitely not in keystone or on he's definitely not on earth so to speak so um okay Continuing on, uh, Calvin Lawrence is here. Give him the thumbs up. I appreciate that, Chisel. Uh, I'd like to see another Kotat save Roland and the others from the loop. That is a killer suggestion, actually. So maybe 
maybe Jack Sawyer does get his own contact together, or maybe, you know, we assume that Gwendy is dead at the end of this third and final book, but she's really just floating in space, you know, and I'm, Hey, people, uh, you can pretty much imagine just about any way to either save a character, resurrect a character, revive a character. I mean, shit, dude, Jake was thrown to his death at the beginning of the first dark tower book and figured out a way to get him back. So yeah, let's have a content that is, uh, it's Gwendy and Jack Sawyer and let's bring in some new characters. Maybe, I don't know shit that, uh, that, that could be pretty dope as far as then, because you have to eventually break the cycle, right? As far as this loop, as far as just, you know, you know, cause a wheel and it just keeps turning and turning and turning and, you know, bringing Roland back to where he was before. Something has to happen. And that's why with the film, it was at least intriguing to say he finally has the horn of L. And so that's where he can finally just, you know, sound that, uh, that proverbial trumpet, so to speak, and actually do what he was destined to do as opposed to being in this repetitive purgatory of sorts. But that is uh, from uh, from Juggla Assassin. That is awesome. Awesome suggestion. I totally concur. Um, okay. Uh, Bunky Time says uh, he should do a one-off just for fun Avengers type event. Cujo, Pennywise, etc. All brawling it out in the haunted manner a la Waxworks ending. Oh man, the ending of Waxwork, man. I I have a soft spot for waxwork. I really do. And we actually had a patron here on the horror show recently ask us to revisit it. And I, boy, it had been at least maybe five, seven years, if not even longer, but Zach Galligan and uh, the rest of the supporting cast, they're all fine. But just the big brawl melee of all you've got, you've got like, I mean, little shop of horrors, like crazy, crazy monster plant and stuff and you know vampires and werewolves and just about anything you can think of man they're all there so that that would be really dope i i think it'd probably make more sense as like a comic book or something but the the closest we came to that is you know some of the stuff we saw in castle rock with just the hodgepodge of all of these different characters in a different turn of the wheel a different level of the tower that's why we had a young annie wilkes played so tremendously by lizzie kaplan in that second season she's really one of the only good parts about that second season but Still, so, once again, that sort of borderline fan fiction is kind of what I felt like Final Task turned into with all of the Tower stuff injected in. Because at least Button Box and Magic Feather, despite borrowing of certain themes, they were kind of their own thing. Whereas Final Task was like, we're going to grasp here, we're going to grasp here, we're going to grasp here. I, I mean... Gwendy is writing a book about the 30s shootout in Derry that is talked about in it. She she writes about and she she writes a book about a tooth fairy in DC, which is basically her recanting the events from the second, but I don't know. Lots of retread, lots of retread. So in any event, uh Seymour chimes in and says, How would you rate this trilogy on its spookiness? Anything stand out? As far as spookiness goes, I would say it's maybe a two out of 10, if even that, there's really, it takes a lot. I'm so desensitized at this particular point, Seymour, that it takes a lot to even unsettle me if I'm watching it on screen, let alone to read it in a book. I mean, some of the only psyching stuff that's really legit creeped me out in in my adult years is just about any time I revisit Pet Cemetery. that uh, that definitely gets me at certain points with the Wendigo uh, and, you know, trudging through the swamp and everything. And it, it's really more so the psychological horror that King returns to where he talks about how much fucked up stuff can somebody encounter as far as horrors, you know, things beyond their comprehension. How much can they withstand before they are off that proverbial deep end and just donezoid? You know, um, the ending of Sometimes They Come Back, the short story is really creepy where dude resurrects his brother and it's just, it's not really his brother, the, the demonic aspect there. So those are at least a few, but as far as spookiness goes, I mean, it, it really doesn't even veer into horror very much at all. At the end of Button Box, uh, the, the, I think his name is Harry, if I remember, but the bully who has been, who started out calling her Goodyear, you know, because Gwendy was so fat when she was younger, who kills her boyfriend, her high school sweetheart, and what she does to him at the end with, she's like, I hope you rot in hell. And then he just like decomposes down the nasty mush. Like that's definitely one of the horror parts. Um, And then in the second book, I mean, the Tooth Fairy Killer, not to be confused with, you know, Red Dragon and, you know, the Thomas Harris stuff, but the, this murderous person who's 
killing young girls and taking teeth and stuff like that's definitely veering into horror and a little bit of spookiness. And if anything, I would probably say the third might be the least on the spooky side of things, aside from the the confrontation I mentioned with that Tahin character, Bobby, and just the discussion with Gwendy about the nature of everything and just the description of the rat face or the rat face or weasel face or whatever the hell it was as they described because you know Tahin, they hide behind the the uh, you know like face of a human, so to speak. But um yeah as far as spookiness goes like this is probably yeah it's a I I even stretched to give it a two. But yeah I think two is fair because of those couple instances that I mentioned. So um okay uh we have a message held for review. Uh, uh, I'll say it. Richard Chismar is a shit writer. Well, that's not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll at least leave that there, Bishop, because of the fact that I, I haven't read, um, Chasing the Boogeyman. I haven't read, uh, The Long December, I think is another one of his. So I, I did see that, um, that Widow's Point movie adaptation where it was the, the it was the, what, uh, it was very similar to 1408. It was totally borrowing from the fact that this guy goes and stays in this allegedly haunted lighthouse and starts going crazy. He's trying to disprove that it's haunted or something. I saw the film adaptation of that, and that was just absolutely awful. It started the guy from Nightbreed, uh, the feature film. But I'm not going to pass judgment on like I I've definitely been upset with Cemetery Dance as far as like long delays for book orders and stuff, and that's and even before the pandemic, but. I understand the nature of getting together these amazing deluxe editions that I'm very proud to own is a process. But, you know, there was a, there was, for instance, and, and I guess I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly dirty laundry it in the fact that I pre ordered something called the Stephen King. It was the Stephen King 2010. It was like a short story grab bag. And it was supposed to be a new exclusive short story and a bunch of other cool goodies and stuff. And, 2021 came and went and I never got it. And I even emailed them and I was like, Hey, I was curious the update on this. I pre-ordered it like a year ago and you know, it's, it was the 2021 grab bag and it never, so still waiting on that, still waiting on the, the special deluxe edition of magic feather. Like I said, but I understand that it's just tough when you promise something and it's promised within a particular timeline. And then it consistently isn't coming to fruition. That's at least what gets me a little bit frustrated. And, and not just the Hail to Stephen King group, but uh, a couple other King groups, uh, you know, Stephen King lovers and uh, the, the constant reader fan page and stuff like I saw similar grips from other people. I don't really frequent a lot of other uh, Psy King Facebook, uh, you know, group pages. I pretty much stick to my own if I'm even if I'm even there since I'm not on Facebook anywhere near as much as I used to be. Uh, it's primarily Twitter. But nonetheless, yeah, it is a I'm not here to like say, uh, Chismar's a hack. He's just like using every opportunity to have King's name bolster his own as far as writing career goes. Although I have heard people say that, which is why I mentioned it just now, because it is, it's an opinion. A lot of people have floated around and that I, I really need to at least give one of his novellas a chance so that maybe I can have a little bit better of that compare and contrast of how much of these books was Richard and then how much of it was Steve because it feels like Steve here and there in books one and three but for the most part um the tone and the language especially felt very different in all three of these books which is what leads me to believe they were that like the the primary creative force was probably Richard for for all of these so um okay uh moving right along uh, Jose says, on a side note, I've always wondered what happened with Derry during the uh, 19, during, during, okay, during the total eclipse in Gerald's game and Dolores Claiborne, since the map and book shows Derry in the path of the blackout sun. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing to, you know, contemplate, Jose. And I guess that would have been, would have been shortly before insomnia, obviously. And, and, you know, and that being, you know, taking place in Derry and everything. Uh, these are the kind of things that, I have said before on various live streams and in other pre-recorded Hail to Stephen King videos that as opposed to doing a Castle Rock television series, they should have done a dairy show. And they should have done a dairy TV series, in my opinion, because of the fact that there were so many different iterations of, you know, when that that 36, 37 year like little window is hitting. And, you know, from battling lumberjacks to the aforementioned shootout to, you know, when all the kids are burned up hunting for Easter eggs to, you know, the stuff at the black spot. I mean, so there you could have had 
each season hit one of those time periods. And hey, one of those times, I, I mean, that's the only thing that makes me wonder, Jose, about the how much they're because they do kind of confirm, and not just this book, but various others, that Derry is pretty much always an evil place, but it just the evil escalates exponentially after those, uh, after those, you know, excuse me, 26, 27 year periods. I think I said 36, 37, like a, like a durple, but um, yeah, so there's always that eminence of evil. And yeah, that is, that's a cool unexplored sort of what happened, you know, at all of those other main king places, especially since I do remember the map that we had in the front of both of those books and how, yeah, you're totally right. You're jogging my memory of things that <laughs> I, that weighed heavily on me a while back and then I kind of forgotten about. Uh, SK fan chimes in again and says that ice cream scoop part still gets me in CR2. Uh, seriously, one of the best things in a King adaptation. And then Seymour says, many thanks, Fuego. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Um, and then Sky jumps on and says, Steven uh, looked like a bunny when he was younger. Eh, well, to each their own. I mean, uh, now, I, now I know what you're referring to. Yeah, King had some dental work done, so that's obviously what is being referred to. But... So since we're we're already nearing an hour and I've seen some thoughts from everybody here, I'm just going to kind of jump through my thoughts on the trilogy as a whole in the release order. So Gwendy's Button Box, and this came out in 17, I want to say. Yep, 2017. And so this one, this was a little baby. I mean, there is really, especially since you've also got the illustrations and it's like barely over, well, I guess it is 100 and it's 170 pages, but there are a lot of, it's a lot of big, I mean, there's lots of, at the end of a chapter, you've got a blank page. And also, as you can see, the font is really, really big. How big? Really big. So this is one that I I was not a big fan of when it first came out. And yet, most notably, with this current reread, I I think it's my favorite of all of the books. And I will say, I will say that specifically because of the fact that First and foremost, it's a coming of age story. And as my buddy Mike Kearns on Mike's book reviews, if you guys have never checked out his stuff, lots of great King coverage, but his his bread and butter, like his forte, which is far beyond any of my comprehension, is the realm of fantasy and, uh, you know, the fantastical and, you know, whether it's medieval or, or whatever it may be. And so he has a lot of amazing coverage over there, but he likes to always point out, uh, you know, similar to me in the fact that, you know, King is the master of the coming of age story. He most definitely is. And so for that reason, I appreciate that. Hey, I'm obviously, I, I never was a, what, a 12 or 14 year old girl. I think she's 14 when, uh, or is she 12? I'm trying to, in any event, when we first meet Gwendy, she, she's about to go into like middle school, so to speak, in uh, what, 1974, I believe, so when we first meet her. And, uh, but yeah, the fact that we go through her just maturing in her adolescence and getting into high school and all of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, all of the, all of the ups and downs of just losing friends. And in her case, you know, losing weight and becoming popular and how sometimes that alienates people like her friend, Olive. And um, so even though it's very much breezed over, like, especially at that page count of like barely 170, but with all of those blank pages at, at the, I guess they're considered chapters, but they're more like section breaks, really. Uh, and then, you know, you've got illustrations and stuff. So you can probably read button box. And I mean, if you're if you're kind of a faster reader, I bet you could read this in like around an hour or so and just and still have a relatively enjoyable experience, despite the fact that it it grazes over so much time with her. But yet the thing I love the most about button box and why it's probably my favorite in the entire trilogy is because of the coming of age aspect. And also based on the simplicity, because it is another riff by King on kind of the monkey's paw sort of thing. And it's even mentioned in the story at one particular point. And the fact that so she has this box, which is given to her by this mysterious RF guy, you know, this Richard Ferris, also the same name as the judge in the stand, which I had I, I remember Judge Ferris, but I did not remember his name was Richard. So this is obviously a very different Richard Ferris RF. I mean, everybody thought it was, you know. It was Randall Flagg, and I still do, based on how the character was portrayed and stuff, at least initially. But so she is given this box. It's entrusted to her, so to speak. And it's, you know, it's like 15 inches by about a foot. So it's it's pretty damn big. It's bigger than I remembered it actually being. It's described as, you know, 15 long and about 15 inches long and about a foot wide. So it's a pretty pretty damn big thing. And it's got the six buttons on top, you know, each corresponding with a continent aside from 
uh, Antarctica because, you know, it's so frozen there. There's really no life there. Um, all of the continental connections are because of the fact that if you can really implement the force to jab down those buttons, there will be something catastrophic that happens on that corresponding continent. And then you've also got the two buttons on the side, a red one and a black one. The red one is almost like, it's almost like a, it's like a wild card. So I, I, I don't want to say Joker necessarily, but you know how in, in like card games, if if you have a wild card, for instance, you can essentially do whatever you want with it. It's got that sort of power in the fact that you, you think about something and you press that red button and you're almost willing it into, into, uh, you know, creation, into transpiring. But then you've got the black button on the other side, which in the third book, Wendy is calling the cancer button, because that is essentially why these, the, you know, low men Tahin and all that stuff, why, why the people who want to destroy the tower in, by the time we get to the third book are actually after the box because of that black button. And because the black button is supposed to like in button box, they're like, yeah, it'll destroy the whole world. But by the time we get to the third book, it's like, no, it will destroy all worlds. And so that's why it's of this significance and why it has to be finally disposed of. But in, in the first book, all of the lore is not massively, you know, developed and embellished like we get by the time we're at final task. And so it's just very simple. Gwendy is trying to save our world. She's, she's trying to save Earth, you know, whatever iteration of Earth it may be. I'm assuming it's not Keystone, but um, yeah. So she has entrusted this box. And uh, besides the buttons, as I mentioned, there's also two different corresponding levers on each side. One disperses these little chocolate animals that, I mean, you get like the guardians and, you know, the, the bean guardians, you get like a turtle at times, but then there's also monkeys. And I'm trying to remember if a monkey is one of the guardians or not. I think so. But in any event, inconsequential because we didn't have tower connections right off the bat. Really. We just had a guy named RF who seems shady and mysterious and who yet still wants her to keep this thing safe. And so maybe I should have known right off the bat that this is either a different iteration of the character or playing with a different set of motivations and intentions. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I just really appreciate the simplicity of that. And I also like the fact that the story does have the monkey's paw element of, okay, yes, Gwendy starts eating the chocolates periodically and she is resisting at least after she hits the red button. And, you know, King mentions Jonestown a lot in his writings. And I've been fascinated with, you know, the Jonestown massacre and Jim Jones and everything since I was a little kid thinking with my religious upbringing and how that's the epitome of religious fanaticism. But yeah, it's uh, it's just intriguing in that regard, in the fact that she is able to just resist and withstand and just she has the positives of, you know, just bearing the burden, eating the chocolates, losing weight, becoming more popular and the strengths and stuff that come with it. But there is also the negative aspect, like, for instance, her friend Olive and, you know, just drifting away from her. But then as Richard Ferris even says at the end, the button box to her is like, well, she was already down a dark path. So you know, you might have contributed a little bit, but, you know, she was already like that. That was already kind of a, her destiny, so to speak, her, her density, which is funny in that regard. But so I do appreciate that. I know I had a few notes, but all of jumping off the suicide stairs. So that's messed up. And then also the longtime bully taking the button box and bashing in Gwendy's uh, high school sweetheart's head with it. So there is actually negativity to the situation. And um, yeah. Lived a very charmed life, as I already mentioned, and she ends up going to Brown University, and she's got all of those coins so she can pay for the Ivy League school, and then she gets the Iowa Writers Workshop and everything, and then Ferris does return, what, it's like eight or ten years later, in, uh, and when she's 22, and he takes the box back, but of course, when we get to our second story, being Magic Feather, right here, that's where uh, Richard going at it on his own, and where the gripes that I vocalized earlier about how, yes, she is not, nothing really bad happens to Gwendy in this second book. Now there is the, the hint of it happening. Like her, her mother is dying of cancer. So that's a sad situation. Her husband is over in this war torn area and he's a, he's like a, he's a photojournalist and, you know, so his, his life is in harm's way, but she has ascended uh, since last we saw her, she has become a successful writer. And then she makes a documentary about her friend who dies of AIDS and she wins an Oscar for it. And then she just on a whim decides to get into politics because of the, uh, just, you know, 
the terrors of lack of LGBTQ rights and she gets elected to the main house of representatives. And so it's just success after success after success in that second book for Gwendy. And she's going back to uh, Castle Rock. And that's where she saves the life of her mother with the little chocolates. And then she pulls her best Johnny Smith and, you know, uses her second sight, which I, d the, everything with the magic feather seems 100% pointless in this second book, because even the explanation that like the parents are like, oh yeah, I found this in the garage. It's your magic feather. Don't you remember when you were a kid and you were 10 years old and we used to vacation with those family members of ours, you went and gave $9 in your quarters that you'd saved up to this kid and you bought this magic feather. And it's, it's almost implied that the magic feather, it has a similar sort of power to the box, but I'm not really buying into that. I, I think it all traces back to the box and the magic feather was just more of, because it's tattooed on her on her what ankle or foot or whatever, but it's more symbolic than of actually being imbued with power like the box. And yeah, she helps solve the tooth fairy murders and we get to re-meet some castle rock characters, but that's really about it. And that, you know, she sees Ferris at the very end and he takes the box back just as quickly and mysteriously as it just showed up in her Washington DC office. He, and he's like, yeah, I just needed it to, to be in safekeeping for a while because you're still the best custodian of it that I've ever had. So yeah, rejoining Wendy 15 years later, December of 99, for whatever reason, Chismore wanted to have an alternate reality, like a different level of the tower where uh, Clinton did not get elected president in 92. And so there's this almost like somewhere between uh, Bush Jr. and Trump president who is like this real hard head and wants to go to war in 99. And plus there's a little bit about the Y2K stuff. I don't know. Like it, at least the, the politics of the second book they're in there, but they're still nowhere near as prevalently injected as we get in the third book. And as I've said on here countless times, I'm a registered independent. I've got, you know, like my parents are very conservative and pretty much all of my friends are very liberal. And I find myself you know, somewhere in, in between, hence the not being the blue or red sort of affiliation. I guess I am probably green at the end of the day, green libertarian-ish, so to speak. But um, yeah, and by the time we get to the third book, and it's much more politically heavily handed at times, and also just the fact that we had to, despite the fact that it takes place for the most part in 2026 in Final Task, and then we have flashbacks, I was just like, did, do we really have to be flashing back to the pandemic and reliving that? Like we're still in the midst of it and we're like two years in at this particular point and it's been sad and depressing and shit. Why couldn't we have just, I don't know, just kept it for the most part in 26, but uh, uh, that is inconsequential and beside the point. Um, but then, yeah, she becomes, you know, from documentary uh, Oscar winning filmmaker to unlikely politician and uh yeah, the, this other level of the tower, you know, with the, you know, with the different president and everything. But I think I've really, the, the box returning is Gwendy. Yeah, I hit all of my different points here. So that uh, inconsequential, but yeah, Magic Feather, I will definitely say is the, is the weakest of the three, but I did find more enjoyment and merit in it. Although it's, it's not really much of a mystery. It's just another book that just breezes along so quickly. And I just, I don't really know what to say beyond that. And then, yeah, we get to final task, as I just said. And, you know, Gwendy has been tasked with going to space by Richard Ferris, because that is apparently the only place where the remaining followers of the Crimson King and, you know, you know, low, low men, tagine, whatever. Um, but apparently that's the only place where they won't be able to get it is in space. But yet, the tech company can get to space and you would think that, you know, North Central and Somber and whatever, that they would have similar technology and, you know, with the world jumping capabilities and everything. So that's where I just, I don't know. And it does really make me wonder if, you know, because uh, King does not like to work off outlines. He says that he just like rolls with it and the story goes where it's supposed to go. I, I wonder if Richard had ideas for this, like he had an outline of this is eventually, you know, getting to the tower related stuff, if that's where he eventually wanted to get. And that was an outline and that was a plan. Or if it was something they just threw more haphazardly together last minute. Not really 100 percent. I can't say that I'm sure. I do not know this stuff. Um, but yeah, so Gwendy goes to space and then we get all of those revelations while she is up there about the fact that 
and you know they, there are minions all the way up there on this uh this and this many flags huh and for another randall reference there the, the many flag space station that where she is that the nefarious forces have chased her all the way up there and in attempting to get the box they killed her husband in a tragic fashion and so she does make that virtuous sacrifice as I mentioned, and you know, in my non-spoiler, I complained about then some little nitpicky things like some of the the corporate references. Like if you saw the Uncharted movie, and for whatever reason they're fighting it out in a Papa John's in Spain, and you're just like, hmm, had to be a Papa John's, right? Just like you know, uh, Gwendy doesn't get an email from her insurance company; she gets an email from aggressive you know that's a, that's the sort of heavy handedness where i'm just like oh yeah like when you know mark Wahlberg is chugging down the yeah, speaking of uncharted but where Wahlberg is chugging down the bud light in the transformers movie it's just like yes i know the king has always referenced his fast food places and referenced his um you know like brands of car and whatnot but i don't know it just felt a little bit different like it was put in there a little bit more deliberately as opposed to naturally uh, for the narrative uh and yet, at this particular point, as a, it's really just jumping more into things that I mentioned specifically in the non-spoiler. Uh, it's it's cool to have these tower connections, but yet, at the end of the day, I don't know if they were earned. I don't know if they were deserved. And I don't know if they necessarily really... I, it just it, it felt like to give some more cred, you know, some more credence to this particular story and the importance of it. And dare I say to sell some more books, man, you know, at the end of the day, let's make it connected to the dark tower. Uh, it, the response has been kind of lukewarm to the first two Gwendy books, the second one, especially, but if we put the dark tower on the goddamn cover and we make sure that, you know, Gwendy's adventures are going to eventually end up tying in with the most epic saga that King has ever produced. Sell more books, get people to give more of a crap. I don't know, but at the end of the day, this is not this is not a trilogy that I particularly see myself revisiting. There are definitely like I always like to revisit King books on their golden anniversaries, you know, five years, ten years, you know, usually in those in those increments. And the book that is going to be the March book of the month, which I will be introducing here in a moment before I head off to watch the the Batman movie, uh, the Battenson. But uh, yeah, aside from those sort of, I guess, forced revisits, it's not it's not one on the level of any of the other Tower stuff, definitely. I mean, this isn't even for me on the level of like, you know, everything's eventual or Little Sisters or anything really even loosely Tower related. And this is more than loosely Tower related. This is like straight up connected, so to speak. And uh, just to double down on the fact that I hope that just presenting these connections again might get King motivated and interested in some more revisits if we don't have them in fairy tale, because a lot of people are speculating the September book will have some tower connections, which would be really rad or some, or Jack Sawyer, you know, some black house uh, slash talisman connections. But at the end of the day, this is, since I, I know we'll eventually end up having to put it in the tier list for Stephen King, because we like to update those on the yearly basis. And I know Cecil and I, after Fairy Tale comes out, will put this on the tier list. But this is the entire trilogy is probably like a D for me. Um, yeah, so I, I I wouldn't go as far as F. I mean, maybe I would go F for for Magic Feather, but it still has it has some merits here and there. But I guess Gwendy as a character, perhaps she didn't endear herself to me as much as I really felt like they were trying to endear her to me. Like, it's one thing if a character is just naturally charming and endearing and whatever, but I felt like they were really heavy-handedly trying to get you to love Gwendy, as opposed to her just being naturally lovable, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of my verdict about this here and talking about it for an hour. And this is, this is one that I was kind of dreading because I felt like I was most definitely a little bit negative on just my thoughts on this series in the, in all three of my reviews. And so for that reason, if, if you loved this series, if you really dug the third book, especially I, I would probably rate them one, three, and then two, but two and three are really neck and neck as far as just 
you know, a lot of borrowing from the dead zone and getting gimmicky with going to space and with adding the dark tower connections that did not, it felt like putting, you know, a square, you know, peg into like a circular sort of opening. It just didn't, didn't really feel like it was naturally just kind of happening. So I don't know. That is my thoughts, everybody, on the Gwendy collection. And now these can return to my shelf. And um, we can all look forward to Fairy Tale coming here in September. But also, we can look forward to, at the beginning of April, discussing the March Book of the Month, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary here in 2022. And that is none other than Everything's Eventual. Hell yizzle. And so this is this is definitely of the lower rung of uh, Psy King short story collections, at least for me personally. This is like, it's between this and Nightmares and Dreamscapes for my like least favorite collections, probably. Uh, and then, you know, the upper echelon is just after sunset and obviously, you know, Night Shift and Skeleton Crew and uh, even Bizarre Bad Dreams I thought was significantly better. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some serious gems in here, most notably The Man in the Black Suit, which is awesome. And we have two tower stories in here in The Little Sisters of Euluria and the title story, Everything's Eventual, with Dinky, what, Earnshaw, I want to say his name is. So, uh, And also a lot of these uh, short stories I have not revisited since initially checking out this collection on my my path of publication is what I've kind of started to call it. And so I'm very much looking forward to revisiting stories that I don't particularly remember super, super well, like the death of Jack Hamilton or uh, LT's theory of pets. And, you know, lunch, I kind of remember lunch at the Gotham cafe. Oh yeah, that's right. 1408 is in here. Um, you've got some mobster stuff like lucky quarter. So a lot of these I have not read in probably six or seven years. So this everything's eventual is our, March, book of the month for its 20th anniversary. And so I extend the grande gracias. I have been Jaime in Fuego. You can find more on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube. And I am going to be doing a review on in Fuego Tainment, my own separate personal channel of the new Batman movie that I'm about to run off and see at this fan event. And I also binge the Burton and the Bale stuff. And I'm going to be doing something with regards to those, whether it's just kind of a, a look back revisit sort of situation or whether I will just talk about each film individually. I haven't decided yet, but sometime this evening on Infoegotainment, my own personal channel, um, I will be putting up a non-spoiler review of this new Batman movie. And then uh, maybe this weekend, myself and Cecil and some of the other crew here on the horror show can get the chance to have like a big deep dive spoiler discussion. So obviously the like, the share, the subscribe stuff means a hell of a lot. Greatly appreciated. Thank you so very much. Danke, arigato, merci. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I hope we've been well met. And until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike, say thank you. Hoping we have, uh, <laughs> hoping we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. I'm excited about going to see Batson. And uh, until next time, I'm a Fright fans, remember to stay scared and read Stephen King because, uh, yes, even though I don't love this one, there are some damn good stories in Everything's Eventual. And once again, with regards to Gwendy, if, uh, you haven't checked it out. Don't just take my word for it just because I wasn't that jazzed on this trilogy. Read it for yourself if you're inclined and make up your own mind. All right, everybody. Peace out. Hope you have a fantabulous rest of your Tower Tuesday. <laughs>